Hello, my friend. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Pete, and we're talking about how to communicate to your clients about your gym's programming. So if you want to learn more about how to be an effective communicator about your gym's approach to fitness, this is a great episode for you. So keep on listening, friends. fitness business nerds what's up welcome to another episode of the business for unicorns podcast today i'm here with pete hello my friend hi there we're back we're back we're it. back at it we're doing it um before we dive into today's conversation i just want to do a quick shout out about our email list dear listeners if you're not on our email list I suggest you get on there. There's a link down in the show notes to join our email list. Not only will you get um, you know, a recap of all of our content every Saturday, but Pete puts out a weekly email, Mark puts out a weekly email, and every single email we put out, we really try and make full of like actionable, tangible, practical advice for things you can use right away. Um, and so if you haven't yet, please click the link in the bio, join our email list, and we promise we're going to send you valuable content that you'll be able to use immediately. That being said, let's jump into today's conversation. Today's conversation came from uh, Unicorn Society member, Blake Denny. Thanks for this question, Blake. Um, and Blake wanted us to talk a little bit about how we communicate our programming choices to our clients. So whether the programming changes from time to time or you change your approach to programming, like what is our strategy for communicating about programming to our clients? You want to kick this one off, Pete? If I'm going to kick it off, I will give the caveat that we run a unique model here with Great. nearly 100% of our clients are executing individualized training material that yep. we design in monthly chunks. So there's a lot of communication as it relates to what the programming objective or strategy is. And I would tell you that there are two different types of communication that we need to think about. One is coach to athlete. And one is business to parent. And yep. that's that's a very big piece of the puzzle because a lot of our athletes are on the younger side. So say definitely 13-ish and on up, a handful of 12s, depending on how engaged they are, excited about the process. But with the younger athletes, it's very common for us to field ongoing questions from parents. What are we trying to accomplish here? When are you going to test them again? How often are we getting evaluated? What can we expect for tangible adjustments by next season? And so programming conversation is just an exercise in expectation management in my mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. Does that bring some clarity yeah. for what we deal with? Yeah, I think 100%. I think, and that's a great way to frame this whole topic, right? It's about expectation setting. It's about clarifying when you first are onboarding a new client, uh, whether it's the parent or the athlete or general population adult, right? Getting clear about this is our approach. This is our strategy. This is how programming works here. This is how you'll learn about it. Uh, this is how you'll be stay informed about it, which is awesome. But let's start with your model, just because I think there's a lot of folks out there who are also do sports performance and work with youth athletes. So can you talk a little bit about the first category of like coach to client communication and like what matters to you there? Yeah. So this starts in the assessment room, right? From the moment we begin talking about injury history and executing movement screenings, things of that nature, we need to help people understand what they're getting into. And oftentimes we'll transition into the weight room and they'll see people walking around with clipboards and we want to make sure they know what they're looking at. And so we design programs in four week intervals and then you get new material every fifth week. Now, any gym owner out there will tell you, you know, it's not the highest percentage of clients who get a four week program done exactly 28 days, or at least not in these performance centers where yep. homework gets in the way, sports get in the way, <laughs> life gets in the way. So that's a whole other conversation. But what we do is we explain how we think about our program design in the sense that we reserve the right to evaluate and adjust our approach consistently. Now that could happen midstream. That could be on day two when we course correct because something just doesn't look right on the training floor. But this is usually from month one to month two, month two to month three. And there's definitely a vision for what the next several months look like when we start an athlete. But we don't design months one, two, three, four, five, six for an off season simultaneously. We might have an overarching kind of concept that's looking to be accomplished. But month two is designed in the back end of month one. 
because we have been using each of these training sessions to basically they're informal assessments and movement screenings. The client might not realize it, but our coaches are watching and taking mental notes and seeing what did and did not yep. work. And then they're adjusting accordingly. But one of the things that we need to make sure we manage from an expectation standpoint is to communicate to the client that we don't throw 100% of this out and start over every month. This isn't a game of novelty. It's nice mm -hmm. that they do new things, but there are certain foundational movements that exist in every program. We might tweak your rep scheme or your, your volume or your rest intervals. We might slightly change a neutral grip to a supinated grip or whatever, whatever language we're using in the weight room. But the reality is they're going to hip hinge. They're going to do lunges. They're going to do certain things that show up in all their programs. And we need clients to understand that that's for good reason. These are yeah. the meat and potatoes of our programming strategy. And it doesn't mean we're lazy because you did trap bar deadlift in some <laughs> capacity in consecutive months. It means that it's important. If it's showing yeah. up in consecutive months, it's valuable exercise for you. And so we need to communicate that early so that people don't get program number two and be like, ah, what the hell? 40% yeah. of this is stuff I pretty much already know. And it's best that we have that conversation before rather than after in a reactive way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's so well said. And I think you really start off strong by reminding people that this is a kind of expectation setting and a kind of education that starts in our first meeting with clients. Like I love that you started there. Like the first time we meet them, we're starting to help them to teach them how we think about these things and how we design our programs. And then that feedback loop between the client and the instructor is, is ongoing forever. Every session, whether the client knows it or not, the trainer is paying attention and making notes, mental notes, or otherwise about what's working and not working in their programming. And, and then they're having some conversations about what's working and not working for the client that's reflected in the next round of programming. And that's an ongoing kind of education project to kind of teach them how to think like your coaches think. So I think that's so smart. What's, what's different when working with, um, with, working with uh, parents? So when working with the parents of the athletes, what changes there? I think what comes into play more often than anything else with the uh, parents of the athletes is managing expectations as it relates to assessment, mm -hmm. because we will have parents who think that their son or daughter needs to be evaluated every 29th day, full on mm -hmm. movement screening, get out the, <laughs> the force plates, get out the just jump mat. Let's test it all. I need to know exactly what I got out of the last four weeks. Yeah. And sure, I want to see people extract value from their investment. But the reality is we don't need to evaluate every single month because like I said, the training sessions are micro evaluations if we're doing our job. So communicating to parents how we think about the cadence of evaluations and their necessity is really important. So we'll bring you into an off season and we'll do some entry testing and lay down some metrics that we're chasing. And if you're going to train consistently with us from say now, which is the start of the fall, until the spring, when the spring sports season starts, where 85% of my clients go in season, then we're going to do some exit testing as well. But there isn't a moment in there where it makes sense to be like, stop everything. We have to put mm -hmm. you on the training table so we can do an evaluation. Yeah, It just doesn't, it's it's not necessary. It's an exercise in, it's, it's just for theatrics. Because totally. every training session is hands-on clients and, and manual interaction. And they're all evaluative in that nature. Now, the next question that comes from there is, okay, well, if I leave for a period, do I get evaluated when I come back? And we have unofficial rules on that front. But my mindset is if we don't see you for 60 days, we're going to do a little bit of an informal movement screening when you come back. Most of the time we know exactly what's coming, but if we can budget 15 minutes in the calendar to talk about what you've been doing the last 60 days, do a quick screen, talk about any shifts and goals and objectives that might be in play now that weren't before, and then move forward accordingly, that usually puts the client and the parent at ease. But as a rule of thumb, I want one to a maximum of two evaluations a year for our clients in general. Yeah. Well, this yeah, is, I, I, I will it's... say though, uh, injuries blow that whole thing up. So of if course. somebody has a significant setback and they have been through a recovery process or a surgical intervention or something like that, we are right back to the drawing board from an evaluation and assessment standpoint when they make their return. 
Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And it, and it also makes sense to me, um, as someone who doesn't have kids, that the parents really are interested in the testing. <laughs> They're like, you know, what am I getting out of this investment? When is little Johnny going to be tested next? Uh, and I think it's useful to know, uh, whether you're working with parents or other general population, what part of these expectations do they care about the most? Right? Is it the testing and the assessing? Is it who's designing my program? Is it what exercises are going to be chosen? Is it like, you know, do I get to give feedback? Right? And I think learning that about your clients early on helps you play this expectations game much better. The answer to the four questions you just asked is yes, 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 and yes. 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 They want all of exactly. the above. They want all I, of it. I'll give you a piece of advice, or I'll give our listeners a piece of advice. One of the best moves you can make, and this is assuming you are not lying is to communicate to your clients and their parents that the team is discussing the athletes training needs behind closed doors. Mm. So we have a staff meeting each week where we're running the list of new programs that have hit the training floor and discussing what the objectives are in this new month of training material, what issues we're trying to keep an eye out, what red flags there are that we need to take into consideration, what we want the interns to know if they're working with a given athlete, what the parents' insecurities are, hitting the training floor. Mm -hmm. All of this stuff is on the radar of the team. And when I say to a parent, you know, we had a staff meeting on Wednesday and we actually ran through Johnny's entire program as a group and they collectively understand the injury he's coming off of, that changes everything. Right then yeah. and there, I've quelled the fears. We're done with the concerns that the athlete is going to fall through the cracks in a group training environment where we have this kind of semi-private model. And we basically say, just because one coach evaluated your son or daughter and that one coach wrote the program doesn't mean we can't collectively deliver on the experience and i can't emphasize this enough don't lie about that <laughs> if you didn't have that conversation as a team if you haven't built that into your routine your your weekly mission control meeting yeah then it's not it's not okay it's not a white lie it's a dangerous lie <laughs> and you need to yeah. you need to fix that hole in your system first before you do anything else but most of the responsible gym owners are doing something of this nature. And it's worth explaining what happens behind closed doors because we are pretty meticulous about these things because we're exposed to a pretty significant amount of risk with the training material we put out there. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. And I, I think that that's true that, you know, I think any even little tiny white lies to your clients can be pretty detrimental because they always find out. <laughs> they, they always know. <laughs> so I just you know, avoid lying to your clients at all costs. <laughs> Sure. Um, yeah, I will, I'll, you know what, I'll add a little bit of, of perspective just from a general pop perspective of, of MFF, right? Because we don't actually do, at this point, any customized, individualized programming. All of our programming is kind of en masse for the group. We do large group training with a lot of people, classroom style, with uh, um, uh, body weight, kettlebell, kettlebells, and resistance bands. And we do uh, small group personal training, six on one training in like a weight room. And in both cases, the programming is kind of for everyone. There's a few different templates and paths people can take in small group training, but both of them are designed by like a core program design team or kind of a rotating series of designers. Um, and they are on a four week cycle, just like you, Pete. So both our class setting and our small group setting on this four week cycle. And one of the ways that we communicate about programming, because I think we get less detailed questions about programming, being kind of a kettlebell gym and not working with athletes, people are kind of generally along for the ride. We do obviously explain throughout the sales process the benefit of the approach that we take, but really most people are happy just to kind of hear our updates every four weeks. So every four weeks, whoever designed the programs that they're about to do, they, they put together this kind of like a little one sheet explaining Here's what's up in this next four week cycle. Here are some of the exercises we chose and why. Here's some, some things we're focusing on these next four weeks and why. And we literally send that out to all of our members. It gets hung up on the wall so they can see it. So if people, if there's any nerds who want to know why am I doing these exercises I'm doing, how does this program fit with what we did last four weeks or the coming four weeks, we answer all of that every four weeks <laughs> in the, basically a general announcement we make to everyone. And for most of our members, that's enough. If they want to have more questions about why why training our programming is a certain way, they can absolutely nerd out with our trainers at any point. But for most of our members, that's all they need. The only exception to that is that we have um we have a class. This is a large group class called Wildcard Wednesdays, and Wildcard Wednesdays is usually designed a little different than everything else. <laughs> it's a, uh, and the trainer who designs it rotates designing the programming, and it's usually based on like a silly theme. 
<laughs> and so, for example, the one I think is coming up this week that we're recording is based on the board game, The Settlers of Catan. So we basically programmed a whole class around the theme of this board game. So if you can, <laughs> if you can imagine it, we designed a class around it from movie themes to music themes. And so for that class, we also, whoever designs it, puts out a little blurb about here's, here's what the Wildcard Wednesday is about this, <laughs> this, this month. Um, and it really goes a long way of making sure people feel looped in and their expectations are set for what they're about to explore. And that's usually sufficient for us. That's usually sufficient for us. Anything yeah, I back, should add? No, I mean, you guys, you always dot your I's and cross your T's. So I have, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you guys how you should modify your <laughs> SOPs relating to programming at MFF. I'll tell you a funny story. We had a, a strength camp. So our group fitness kind of adult morning training thing. Um, we had our coordinator for that used to make a habit of at the end of the day, putting the next day's regimen on the marker board mm. and then he'd publish it on the strength camp Facebook page. Like, can't wait to see you guys in the morning. We're ready to go. Yep. And we started to see very specific trends in people who would opt out when they didn't like the exercise material. <laughs> and so somebody would be super consistent would also consistently skip like a certain, I don't know, deadlift day or something like that. Yep. And when we'd call them out on it, why weren't you there? They'd be like, I'm not coming if you're telling me what the punishment's going to be the next day. And yep. I always thought that was really funny because the, the objective was to create engagement and, yep. and community and dialogue. And instead, it was just allowing people to opt out of hard things, yep. <laughs> which was kind of obnoxious. So we don't have that same habit anymore. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think for us, you know, the wild cards Wednesdays tend to have the opposite effect. Like we make specifically make them Wednesdays as like a hump day. as like something to look forward to. You know, like the middle of the week, I'm going to go to a class that's themed on the Barbie movie, right? Or I'm going to go to a class that's themed on like MFF, like my favorite musical, you know, like, and that's something that gets them to want to come when maybe they were thinking they were going to skip it. And so that's, you know, that's kind of fun and exciting. I'll say this because just because it's top of mind, I see in the folks we talk to every day in Unicorn Society, when it comes to programming, the thing that most of them do that I think is um you know is shooting them in the foot is um most of them make it too complicated most of them spend too much time making the programs too complicated so they have to spend a lot of extra time explaining them and um and uh, kind of tap dancing around it uh and they spend a lot of time actually designing the programming i think if there's any any advice i have in that direction again i'm not a trainer so you all listening can tell me to go f myself it's fine but I would say most of you should spend more time on other aspects of the client experience than making your programming so complicated that every single program is so highly individualized and so highly unique that it takes someone 30 to 60 minutes to even design a single program. That's too much. It's not a good use of everyone's time. And most clients, I would say even sports performance folks, probably don't care enough. What they want, and this is something we've, we've moved towards at MFF, is we really start talking about individualized coaching, right? Customized coaching, that on the floor, when we're interacting with you, that's where the customization happens, not in the pre-planning pre -planning and the programming in advance. We're actually going to, at MFF, you're going to get a template, but we're going to make it fit you and your needs and your preferences in the room because we're really attentive coaches, and so we can spend more time adjusting, progressing, regressing, having people change up the exercises entirely. We can do that on the floor in real time. So we've been trying to stress more and more the importance of individualized coaching, customized coaching, but the programming actually being a little bit more generic, such a more efficient use of our time. So no, that's maybe not right for everyone, but that's certainly the sweet spot we've been, we've been finding at MFF. Does that make sense? Well, look, we we position ourselves as an individualized program design facility. Yep. And I'll tell all of our listeners that exceedingly nuanced programming doesn't scale. Yeah. And what it does is it pisses off your colleagues. So <laughs> a decent chunk of our weekly meeting can can be conversations about things that staff members are tired of having to coach on the training floor, tired yeah. of seeing in programs because they know that they're so coaching intensive that it is compromising the experience for the balance of the athletes in the room. Yeah. And so look, we're into our 17th year here. This is a song and dance we can't stop doing. So what we do is we just continuously keep our finger on the pulse of programming habits 
and we have SOPs surrounding discussions on programming do's and don'ts, Great. things that we really like to respectfully request stop showing up in our peers' programs. <laughs> and then we discuss as a group ways to regress or progress them in more logical ways that work for the group as a whole, not at the expense of everyone except for one athlete at one given moment. Yeah, I think that's really well said, Pete. I think that's the system I think a lot of gyms are missing, right? Because everything in this universe, including programming, moves in the direction of complexity. <laughs> and in programming, we need some system that builds a current in the opposite direction, that makes make, makes the exercise library smaller, not bigger, that makes you know, that makes all the coaching cues uh, less, not more. Right? Like, I think there's something that has to be fighting against that desire for complexity. And I think what you described is exactly it. Yeah, well said. Um, well, let's leave it there. I think we really, we covered this topic of like how to communicate about programming. I think we covered it from a uh, gen prop perspective and a sports performance perspective. So I feel like we nailed it. Anything you want to add for our listeners as we wrap things up? Oh, come to Philly and meet with us at the retreat. I don't know <laughs> if we still have spots available. So that's yeah, it. we might by the time they're listening to this. And it, I think it was pretty much sold out, but we were going to add a few more because there was really high demand. So if you at the time of listening to this, we still have spots for Philly. Um, please come. Yeah. Email us or um, just hello at business .com and let us ask us if we have spots. If we have them, we're happy to have you. Um, yep, mid awesome. September. Yeah, it's um, it's going to be a good time. It's going to be a good time. Well, thanks for thanks for a great conversation, Pete. Um, and dear listeners, if you enjoyed this podcast, please, please, please go leave us a five star review everywhere you listen to this podcast. Um, uh, it really helps us find more listeners like you who can value, who can benefit from this content. Um, and uh, and I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for a great chat, Pete. Talk soon. Yeah.